Hello, Keith Kaiser here with another study in God's Word, doing studies in the book of Acts, and today we're at chapter 8, verse 1. Acts chapter 8, verse 1, reading in the Word of God, it says, Now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. And we see here that this was the beginning of a real hard time for the church. And indeed, in the providence of God, hard times come. Sometimes there are easier times, times of relative peace. And in the Western world, this has predominated for the last few centuries, where we've had a lot of religious freedom and a lot of freedom of the press and freedom of, the, of assembly and so forth. So there's been little physical persecution. I don't say it's non-existent. Because on the individual and small community level, there certainly has been, uh, from place to place, physical persecution. And even people have been murdered for the sake of the gospel. But it's the rare thing. It's uh, abnormal uh, compared to other parts of the world. We could look at uh, other parts of the Muslim world, for example, or uh, in India, and physical persecution has been greater in those countries. And some of the closed countries, one can think back to the times of communist hegemony in the Eastern Bloc countries. There was a lot of terrible persecution against the church. One only has to think of Richard Vermbrand and Tortured for Christ, his account of the difficulties that the Romanian church faced, or Drew Craig's book, Joy and Shared Tears, that talked about how things were when Romania opened up in the early 90s. And how persecution under Nicolae Ceausescu was a recent memory phenomenon there. We could think about Albania and other places too where the church had a lot of difficulties. And, and it still goes on in the world today. It's still a terrible thing. And missiologists tell us that the church has suffered more martyrdoms in the 20th century than all the previous 19th centuries combined. So it still remains true what the Lord Jesus said in John 16, in the world you shall have tribulation. Thank God he went on to say, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So that remains true as well, that although there's opposition, although there's persecution, the Lord is building his church. He hasn't stopped. And as Tertullian noted, as far back as the second century AD, the blood of the martyrs is seed, that that's the seed of the church. The church has actually grown and thrived uh, in places where it's been persecuted. It's not been stamped out. In any case, we trust God to bring us what we need. And uh, we can say, though earth and hell my way oppose, uh, that the Lord's loving kindness is still faithful to us. Now, here we read that Stephen's murder, as sad as that was in and of itself, to lose such a gifted and able evangelist and apologist of the Christian faith, that was tragic in its own right, but it was also the signal for the enemies of the church to step forward and to physically persecute in an unprecedented way. There had been physical persecution previous to this in the book of Acts. We've seen James and John and Peter and others that were beaten and that uh, suffered and so forth. Of course, the Lord Jesus was killed on the cross. Uh, that was the greatest persecution that the world has ever seen, to take the Son of God and to put him to death. But now we see that this young man, Saul, whom we first meet at the end of Acts chapter 7, he's there holding the clothes of those who stoned Stephen, that he's not just an innocent bystander, nor is he merely an eyewitness of what occurred. But it says he was consenting to his death in chapter 8, verse 1. Uh, some translations say he was in hearty agreement to it. Later, when he gives his testimony, he would say that he compelled many of the believers to blaspheme, that he went into houses and disrupted their meetings and carried them away to prison. And when they were put to death, he says he cast his vote. In other words, he voted for the death penalty. He said, yes, these people are deserving of suffering capital punishment through no other crime than their identity as followers of the way, followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Saul viewed them as heretics, and he, as he would later say, he thought to do many things against the name of Jesus Christ. So he went about trying to eradicate that name from Israel, and even wanted to go to the diaspora, to the Jews that were scattered 
uh, throughout the Greco-Roman world and root out these nascent pockets of the church and destroy it utterly. We're going to find out, though, that he couldn't oppose God. In the next chapter, chapter 9 of Acts, we read about his glorious conversion. Nonetheless, Saul was here trying to persecute the church, and we'll think about that more by and by. But it says further in the verse, At that time a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. Now, uh, again, 2 Timothy 3.12 promises us, Yea, and all who will live godly in Christ... <coughs> <clears throat> Pardon me. Yea, and all who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So suffering for Christ is not abnormal. It's not aberrant. It's not the uh, thing that is the uh, out of the norm experience of a Christian. Rather, it is normal Christianity. As we preach and live Christ in the world, the world will hate us. Why will they hate us? Because they hated Christ. Now, First Peter makes it clear. If any man suffer, let him not suffer as an evildoer or a busybody in other people's business. Uh, we aren't to suffer for our personality flaws, for our errant character, for bad business behavior, for breaking legitimate laws. Those aren't to be the origin of our suffering. But if we suffer as a Christian, that's thankworthy before God. God will not only praise us for that one day, but he's going to recompense that kind of suffering. And here the persecution comes against the early church. Now, what did it accomplish? Well, the church was mainly bunched up in Jerusalem there. That's where it had begun, after all. And the Lord said, You shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth, back in chapter 1. And heretofore, they had been witnesses in Jerusalem and a little bit in Judea. And somewhat, we'll see in this chapter, they begin to go out to Samaria as well. But this really helps the mission of the church forward, that rather than stamping out the church and stopping the preaching of Christ, it actually scatters the church uh, to be all over the Greco-Roman world at that point. And the word here for scattered is the word from which we derive the word diaspora. We take diaspora directly from the Greek. It's a transliteration into English. And a diaspora of people is a people that have been scattered throughout the world, people that are expatriates, that, in other words, come from another place and live as aliens in, in a, a, another country. <coughs> and this is the verbal form of that. The, the word originally was an agricultural term. It means to scatter like seed. Now, again, that idea brings about an amazing word picture that here the persecution scatters the believers through the world. And what does that accomplish? Well, uh, let's just jump ahead in Acts to chapter 11, and we get a little taste of what God is doing by permitting the persecution. And so we go ahead to Acts chapter 11 and verse 19. It says there, Acts eleven nineteen. Now those who were scattered, same word as back in Acts 8, now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. But some of them who were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenist, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. So this scattering actually resulted in many more preaching points being established. As the believers were scattered, wherever they were scattered to, <coughs> they carried the good news, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they wanted to tell others about it. Initially, to people like themselves, the Jews, which they probably had the most natural contact with. I mean, wherever they went, that there was a synagogue, they could plug in and be received as kindred spirits, as people from the same ethnicity and same cultural background. Uh, but they would also start to speak to the Hellenists, to the people that were Grecianized, in other words. This includes Jews that had uh, learned Greek and were more accommodated to Greek ideas, even perhaps to Jews that weren't so observant in their Judaism, that had embraced a syncretistic worldview, mixing Greek ideas with Judaism. 
And it could also be that we're talking about Gentiles here that had uh, identified with Israel, that were God-fearers, as we'll see, that's a group that the church later reaped a great harvest among them. Many of the God-fearers who attended synagogues, people that believed in the God of Israel, but they hadn't gone all the way and gotten circumcised and converted to Judaism, but they were interested in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And perhaps it's to those... <coughs> <clears throat> excuse me, as well as to proselytes, to full-fledged converts to Judaism, that the gospel is now coming, and people got saved there in Antioch. So through the persecution, the believers get scattered to Phoenicia, up in modern-day Lebanon, to Cyprus, which is still called Cyprus today, to Antioch, which is one of the most ancient cities still existing, and that's up in Syria, as we call it today. <coughs> <laughs> and wherever they went, they told people about the Lord Jesus Christ, and they saw fruit for their labors. The seed, as they were the seed that was scattered, they also took the seed of the word and scattered that, and it brought forth fruit. It brought forth others coming to Christ, and as we'll see later in our studies in Acts, it resulted in an assembly being planted in Antioch, and one that was going to have great effect, because they were going to send out the first modern-style missionary team to uh, the Gentile world, and namely in Barnabas and Saul, soon to be called Paul. Uh, but that's getting ahead of ourselves, and that's much later in the story. Nonetheless, uh, when suffering comes, when persecution comes, or even just the affliction that comes in this world, we sometimes stop and say, <coughs> <coughs> pardon me, we sometimes stop and say, why? You know, why has God allowed this to happen? When passages like this show us that God has a plan, that even though he permits evil to run a certain course, it doesn't thwart him. He can even work against it and counter it. That this is what Romans 8.28 is talking about when it says, For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and are the called according to his purpose. So we comprehend that there is a bigger picture story going on behind the scenes. <clears throat> and uh, when we can't trace the hand of God and see exactly what he's doing, we have to trust the heart of God. We have to believe what the scripture says about him, that he loves us. He's already proven that by giving his son. And so we don't need to stop and think, you know, the, the sky is falling and the world's going to collapse and all this horrible stuff is happening and somehow God's not in control. <clears throat> <clears throat> quite the converse. Satan is working. He's opposing. Evil men are opposing, but they cannot thwart God. They shall not win. God's already won the victory through the triumph of the Lord Jesus Christ rising again from the dead. And now being worked out in history is that victory. Do apologize for my cold. Um, heavily medicated, cough drops, you name it, but the cough is still with us a little bit, so I hope it doesn't distract you from the Word of God. I'm going to be done here in a moment, but suffice it to say that <coughs> even though in retrospect we can see that the church grew through this persecution, it doesn't mean we have to like persecution itself. And it doesn't mean that we don't lament those who are killed in persecution. <coughs> <clears throat> and that we don't grieve over the believers who have suffered. And we see that here in verse 2 when it says, Devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. So funerals are biblical, and it's quite natural to mourn over our loved ones who've died and our brothers and sisters in Christ, even though we know they're with the Lord, even though we know they have eternal security in Christ and that men can kill the body but not cast them into hell because the Lord Jesus already suffered judgment for them on the cross. We can say there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8, 1. But at the same time, we miss those who die and we lament those who are taken away from our vantage point prematurely, taken away in the prime of their life like Stephen was and killed through the wig. <laughs> <clears throat> pardon me, and killed through the wickedness of men. <clears throat> 
So we thank God that Stephen wasn't lost and quite natural for the church to mourn, but soon their mourning would give way to rejoicing as they'd see a great harvest come from this persecution. Thank you for listening.